Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our fourth and final uh, blockchain presentation for July. So uh, my name is Chris Lukes. I've been in a lot of them behind the scenes. So hello, everyone. With me tonight is Kay, as always. And then we also have uh, Sherry Jones, our featured speaker tonight. So I'll go ahead and flip over to the slides, and Sherry, feel free to start on. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Kay. So this week's presentation is on blockchain effect on the future of game design. So you can see there's a series. Last week we focused on blockchain effect on humanities. This week is on uh, game design. And some of you might recognize that background. I hope some of you do. That's our good old Tetris, you know, blocks. I figure it's all related. Anyway, let's go next. Okay, so this is just a reminder. So if you missed last week's presentation, there's a link to last week's presentation. It's just a bit.ly blockchain humanities. I explained how blockchain worked in that previous presentation, so there will be less explanation of how blockchain works in this week's presentation. So uh, please go next. Okay, so blockchain technology is now really hot in game development. I'm seeing this term pop up everywhere in a lot of the uh, advanced game developer blogs, okay? So I wanted to mention that this presentation served two purposes. Yeah, it's all forecast, but some of the things I'm going to present to you is currently in development now even though it has not reached mainstream, which means really small studios are trying to actualize using blockchain for game design. Other predictions are based on my own vision of what can happen with blockchain. So keep that in mind as we go forward with the slides. So please go next. Okay, so there's a relationship with blockchain decentralized, uh, a decentralization, and we've talked about this before, but let's just refresh our memory on what exactly it is. So the word decentralization actually has no, um, there is really no agreement on exactly what it means, but at least in terms of the web, we're really referring to distributing the same set of data in pieces across multiple uh, servers or processors. So instead of hosting everything on a single processor, a central processor, or a central database storage place, you're spreading it all over the place, okay? And the reason why you would do that Part of the argument is that when you decentralize data, you are shifting authority from a single authority to multiple sources of authority. And some people believe because of the use of SHA-256, so we talked about SHA as a security language um, to create hash values, um, a lot of people believe that if you use blockchain to decentralize data, you can prevent hackers from hacking information since everything is distributed and blockchain is primarily, the interest for blockchain is for that decentralization. So if we can go next. Okay, so first off, because we just talked about hacking, I wanted to talk yeah. about that relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I'd have to say, you know, our, our gaming guild and Chris might like to jump in here also, but we always see attacks. You, you know, usually at, at some point in time when something's new, um, when, when we're playing MMOs like World of Warcraft, we normally we normally will see some kind of hack that's a deny, you know, that that's a denial of service. Right, exactly. So, so in the game world, we see a lot of hacking. So, if you're not playing like a a big studio game, uh, for example, WoW, you know, they they have more people working on security mm -hmm. because the game is is bigger. Um, but smaller games suffer a lot because they're they, you have to build a lot of security, right? As new hacking methods are available, people constantly have to upgrade their games. And well, Chris, exactly. You and, yeah. and you're sure, definitely. And in, in other pieces of the issue you have in gaming is typically, you know, most gaming is not as distributed as as uh, as the blockchain is. What they are, they are you logging into a specific server, and so the problem they run into is the DOS attacks, uh, the denial of service attacks, where basically they're attacking uh, the few connection points to the server. They're just bombarding the servers with requests, and so the servers can't, you know, screen what is a real 
login attempt and what is a fake one. And so then it starts shutting down the game experience. So it is one of those uh, one thing that would be definitely benefit from from having this type of game design. Now the challenge, of course, is would a would a game manufacturer want you know its proprietary information on a whole bunch of different copies of its proprietary information out there for public consumption? That that is part of the blockchain. Now, granted, it would be. Um, you know, it would be encrypted. It would be hidden from the users. But the question is: Is are they are they would they be comfortable with trying to roll out? How would they roll out an update? Mm-hmm. You know, in a decentralized manner, how do you update? Do you update? Try to update every machine in ten minutes. Uh, so the <laughs> right, right. And and in in reason memory, so 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 both K and Chris, you know, you can speak to this. In reason memory, has there been a lot of denial service attack against WoW? Oh, yeah, yeah. And and not just recent memory, what I'd I'd say probably in the last 12 months, there has been a lot of them. In fact, the the guild has gotten to, um, you know, we we have some people who who work with computers and programming and and things like that in the guild. And and they usually find us, you know, some site that shows all all the attacks that are happening. So instead of playing, we're we're, we're we're getting in over VoIP. Um, we use Mumble, but we're watching the attacks rather than oh. playing the games and waiting for and waiting for Wow to Wow to adjust to that. Oh wow! So you are watching as you're watching the hacking effort. That's kind of fun. <laughs> okay, well, let's go next because I wasn't addressing directly at Wow, but Chris, you have lots of good points. So as we go through this, you guys can keep jumping in with some new ideas. Okay. Um, so one of the major problem in game right now, besides hacking for now, is is saving game history. So I separate into two main problems. There are more than those two, but these are the two main problems. So currently, game developers are trying to save game histories on their own servers. So a game server, you know, I mean, game history refers to everything regarding your gameplay, right? So everything that you've done in the game. Uh, every time you log in, log out, who you defeated, and so forth, that's belonging in that gaming history. So a couple of scenarios, which is, for example, if their own central servers go down, maybe due to hacking, let's say, then that entire section of gaming history can disappear um, if they have no other backup elsewhere. Um, The other scenario would be that the hacker can gain access to the game's backend programming, and they can alter the game, uh, as in trolling, right, to change the gameplay so that some players have more hit points or experience points, or that they make the game entirely unplayable just to make the game studio suffer. Okay, so those those are the two main strategies, and also with a uh, uh, denial of service attack that uh, and, uh, Chris was talking. And I, about. I'm yes. just pulling this up just so, and this is this is the game that we we're talking about. But there is so much information here. You're right about what I've already done. Where have I done this? What what have I done? What haven't I done? And to lose this would, you know, be be losing like your like your investment in in playing this over the whole time. Exactly, and that could be very very costly because people do spend money in games. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and they might arise. leave a game <laughs> because exactly. everything was lost. Right. Right, so that's a really big problem. Um, the other, the other side is cheating, which is when players use external software, right, to manipulate the gaming system um, for their own benefits. And all kind of manipulation happen: raising game level, experience points, coins, get additional character outfits, objects before their level comes <laughs> up. So, Kay, you want to speak about that? <laughs> um, yeah, I, then I could have Chris jump in too. But, but what I was, I was. I, here, here, here's the thing. At least where we play, we know if, say, we're playing the game, and there, say, we're playing it with 30, 40 other people in what's called a battleground. We know if someone has a hack. We know if someone has done something to do a speed boost or something like that, so that they get an un, uh, an unfair advantage. It's really, it's really easy to pick up, to pick up. And the other thing about hacks, I mean, the hacks and the cheats. When I show this to people, I usually pull up Club Penguin. 
I type in YouTube Club Penguin and cheating because there are so many different you know there's different ways to manipulate things and and people find different ways to go in. So even as something that sounds as innocent as Club Penguin, you're seeing the these kind of things happening. Exactly, so, great example. So every game has to worry about it. Right, every game. It's just that the bigger studios have money to kind of throw at security. Smaller studios probably will suffer a lot more because they, they need to hire a lot of security people to make that happen. So yeah, that's a big problem. Um, let's go next. Okay. So the, the term now that's been floating around for the last, actually, three years, actually, um, blockchain-powered decentralized games, or the other term is called decentralized play systems. So this is a thing since three years ago. Um, so there's a lot of game developers using, uh, interested in using blockchain primarily because of the decentralization and for the security, because those DOS attacks, hacks, cheats are happening in greater frequency as people learn how to use computers. So <laughs> the idea is that the decentralized game is less hackable. And when you decentralize a game, there are some implications to this. So we're still talking about theoretical thoughts here. So one of the ideas is that a game developer not only secure the game, but they're relinquishing some of their power or responsibility to the player. So a three scenario that I came up uh, quickly here is that a community of players uh, record and maintain their own win and losses gameplay data for their own guild or the individual player. Well, no, here's the reason I'm, I'm laughing. Chris could jump on, too. We yeah. use a lot of external sites to go ahead and compare our performance to, to other players' performance so that we can go ahead and improve. Um, right. So, okay. uh, in those sites there, the, the same thing with the, the, those are already in existence. The, the same problem exists, which is those sites, if they go down, then you lose your data. So some people I know use like Excel spreadsheets, <laughs> good old fashioned Excel spreadsheets, right, to, to save that. But uh, you still have oh, the yeah. problem with the internet. Yeah. Chris, go ahead. Well, I think, I think other pieces here is that it also might actually speed up the play of the game and reduce the ping time uh, between the, the time that you uh, basically enact a action on your computer and the time that it's recognized by the game. So I think that's one of the nice other pieces here that you see is the idea of by decentralizing the game and putting more components on the user's computer via blockchain, there would be a shorter... Uh, shorter ping time, which would, uh, especially in games like first-person shooters and uh, player versus player type scenarios, that's usually one of the biggest challenges is latency and ping, and, and, and ping times that seem to be um, one of the major issues. And so I think that's one of the things that you also might uh, benefit might come out of decentralizing the game is that if you provide more, p more of the asset, more of the game actually on your computer, your computer is probably, and you are putting a little bit more computing load on your computer, but um, you also might have, might reduce that, that lag. Right. And this, uh, what you gave us is also related to the whole idea with the in-game economy and game assets, the idea that the player might be managing it on their own blockchain, so that it probably alleviate the server power, but also it makes things a lot faster. So those are, those, those are all related. Those scenarios certainly um, speak to when you talk about speed. Um, so if we can go next. Sure. Okay. So I have to talk about Hunter Coin. It's been around for a little while, but Hunter Coin is supposedly the first decentralized autonomous video game that relies on human mining. Now, I am not sure about the claim that it's completely decentralized, but there are certain rumors around, you know, the, the, the blockchain community that Huntercoin is probably the first completely decentralized video game currently. Because when it first came out, it wasn't completely decentralized. So if we can go next, and I'll explain how this game works, actually. So this is how they designed it, and this is according to their own uh, documentation that all the game data in Huntercoin is completely controlled by all the players, their, their own communities. So everything in game data, we're talking about in the game, they have coins, characters, and maps. 
are stored on the Hunter King blockchain. So they have a blockchain to store everything to make things not hackable. Now the other thing with the coins, character, and maps, the game actually is a human mining game. So what we mean by human mining is instead of letting a machine or software do the mining for you so you can get Bitcoin, it's basically a way to get players to run around the map and gather coins so they're actually mining <laughs> coins that's represented using the, the you know, uh, picture or, or um, a game asset to represent the coin, but at the same time you're actually getting something. So what I wrote there is that according to the site, each time you mine you get receive 10% of the block rewards. It's a very small amount. But that 10% is also equivalent to what they call one HUC per minute. So HUC is the hunter coin uh, currency uh, 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 stance. Okay? Now the player actions are also recorded as transactions on exactly on the hunter uh, coin blockchain and they still use SHA-256 encryption. SHA-256 um, is used primarily with Bitcoin. So I think a lot of um, the game studios are still using SHA-256, even though Ethereum is using SHA-3. So the encryption is lower than SHA-3, but 256 is what Bitcoin prefers. Now, uh, Kay, did you have something to add there? I, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm taking a look at the website, and it will be, it will be interesting to, to look at it, at it a bit more. In depth, right? In depth. Yeah. yeah. Now, they also use P2P network, a decentralized P2P network, to allow players to communicate with each other that is associated with the game. So basically every element that we're talking about, including assets and even the communication method, is P2P or decentralized and also associated with their blockchain. So everything is safe on the blockchain. And also they actually allow forking. Now, when they say forking, they were not clear whether it's hard fork or soft fork. But assuming that it's community oh. driven, they yeah. can decide if they disagree okay. on the way the game runs. That's that's really and that's that's really interesting because when we I know we've been studying Bitcoin for you know for a while, but um, with Ethereum and and the question about the soft fork or, or the hard fork, that really you know. When we were reading articles and posts and things on it, we really thought that was a major decision. But in a game, it might not that be that big of a decision. It might be like the it might be nothing more than say a gaming guild making a decision on on what raid they're going to do or 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 what they're going to or what they're going to pursue. It might not feel as right. heavy handed. Well. You know, I can still see Gil getting angry about hard forks because hard fork essentially is a complete rollback to the starting point. So as if no transactions happen. So I can imagine that, you know, in game world, in game language, you have save points, right? So if they didn't like the mm -hmm. gameplay, imagine if the guild members override by popularity vote. Like, oh, you won most of the points, but because we don't like how the gameplay went, we're just going to roll back and pretend you never won anything. I can kind of see where disagreement can happen. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, definitely. I mean, and that's that becomes a popularity war. I mean, you're seeing it a little bit now with Ethereum where, you know, to go back to one of our previous stories, where the people who hacked Ethereum hired individuals to act as basically um, lobbyists to lobby miners to vote against forking because uh, they didn't want to give the money back or have to lose the money that they got through their ill-gotten gains. Right. So, I mean, that's that brings a whole different piece to it is, so even if you do, you know, exploit the game, get lots of, of hunter coins, could you, you know, could you give or reward other miners to not not do the fork. So in other words, you could, you know, how, what percent of the amount of money would you have to redistribute <laughs> to ensure that you get a majority of voters to not fork? And then you get those issues there because, I mean, that's, that's just messy. Um, right. allowing, allowing a more popularity vote for a fork, that's, that's you know, right. that's just, it's really messy really quick. Right, and especially when there's money on the line, since they actually give you real money, well, in their yeah. currency, that can get really tough. It's not just rolling back gameplay, but rolling back 
Ooh, transactions. That I can see some problems there. Well, yeah, and also the gameplay. So what happens if you downed a boss, a really hard boss? Yeah. Well, that's... Or you, you solved a really hard problem, or you did something like that, and then they decided to go back and fork the game to before you actually downed it. So you can oh, spend God. months of your time trying to down a boss or to solve a problem, and then it gets forked back, and you're like back to square one. Oh, God. You know, the only other solution, because it's not included in the slides, but, you know, this is why we talk and think about possibilities here. I remember yeah. when the Silent Hill PT came out. Yeah. You know, and they decided not to continue the game, but then the players who downloaded the game onto PlayStation still have mm -hmm. copy of that game on the platform, right? So as long as you don't delete it, it's still there, like a ghost hunting your 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 console. I can kind of see maybe maybe that that's what they have to do is let people download a play, but again, according to the gaming history, it wouldn't be permanent. So. You know, maybe for old times' sake, you let someone download the gameplay for downing a boss, but I can still see some problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's some challenges there as yeah. well, because uh, anytime you roll back the game, it's how extensive is that rollback? Is it just currency-related? You just, you know, you just push the currency, or you're also pushing back play event events, events that happened in the game since that time. So they exactly. have to really make sure that they're very careful about how they create the forking mechanism. Exactly, exactly. Now we can move on because there's uh, uh, quite a few like this. Um, similar to Hunter Coin, but Hunter Coin in itself is a video game, okay? Now I'm going to show you guys Peer Play. So Peer Play calls itself, again, they always call themselves the first something. So I'm just writing according to their site. I'm not sure if they are the first, but they call themselves the first decentralized tournament management and wagering platform. So they have a wider reach. Not only do they manage player-to-player -player tournaments or guild-to-guild -guild tournaments, but they also manage like wagering. So casinos, for example, using this platform. And this is a screenshot, actually, from their site of actually what the platform looks like. It's for your March Madness bracket. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> like fantasy football, but you know, oh, blockchain. So, so and March college playoffs since you know. Yeah. Mad March Madness is trademark now. Right. But you know the difference <laughs> the, <laughs> the difference between this and say something like fantasy football is that actual currency exchanges. Oh happen. yeah. Yep. Um so that gets tricky and currently we, we saw the news that, you know, we're still not seeing the courts are not recognizing Bitcoin as currency, they're recognizing a property. So because of the legality of the thing I wonder what's going to happen to platforms like this, you know, that's allowing actual trade to happen. But let, let's go next, and I'll explain a little more on what they claim that this platform can do. So what they are doing, actually, is they're using smart contract technology. So specifically, they say, we use blockchain, but what they're trying to do is use the smart contract technology so that when the player enters a tournament, it's an agreement between yourself and the opposing player that indeed you're going to enter the tournament and indeed you'll be there for one hour and like for example if your internet dropped out within the one hour you forfeit you lose I mean that's all going to be documented so no one can cry foul um, also everything they claim everything is safe on their peer play blockchain okay all wins and losses are recorded um, and they claim that this will be fair. This is how you ensure fairness. They also have the system called the fee sharing program, and they call that fee backed assets, so FBA. Okay, and a quote from PeerPlay they said, This means the blockchain automatically distributes a percentage of the fees from every jackpot for every game on the entire network to the holders or PeerPlay's core tokens. Interesting. So, yeah. Did you want to say more, Okay. No, no, no. I'm just doing interesting and still processing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. You know, it's it's a lot, right? They have all these acronyms, and they claim what this is supposed to be, but I don't know exactly what kind of depth of fees that they're talking about. Do all the players in the guild get a piece of the fee? We're not really sure, okay? Um, and certainly I have not used peer play, so I can't claim... Um, exactly how that's going to operate, but they're constantly improving their software. So it's something to watch, okay? This is kind of a big thing right now, peer play. So let's go next. 
I have to laugh. I'm I'm up on their website and 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 they're saying we wrote an overview overview because some people are not familiar with navigating GitHub. Oh, <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, not everyone's a programmer. Okay, so GitHub is a little harder for for most people. So good. Um, the next section I wanted to talk about is the use of blockchain to trade to actually trade virtual in-game objects. So what we have talked about before in the section one is really about security and also allowing players to actually use Bitcoin as a currency in games. But this one is not about the money, it's more as in trading objects. Now this background, does anyone on our panel recognize what that is? Yes, no? Maybe? <laughs> okay, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, Pokemon. <laughs> that's that's Abra because it says so. Um, we're gonna trust that that's Abra, <laughs> yep. and that's your little Pokemon card that's actually yep. in Pokemon Go, and that's part of their promo video. And I just wanted to show that that would be an example of a virtual in-game object. Okay, a card actually works. So let's go next. All right. So what exactly are they? Some of the term is called virtual in-game objects. Other terms you'll hear virtual game assets, right? They are basically game elements that you can actually see within the game. Sometimes they're playable, sometimes they're not. So for example, you might be running through a platformer and there's a tree standing there. If you can't engage with it, technically that's still a game asset, right? Because you can see it inside the game. But some of the other examples is like, for example, the tubes in Super Mario Brothers where Mario can actually engage and jump down the tubes. Uh, the infected type of zombies in Last of Us. So those are crazy looking things, but we, we won't look into that. Uh, <laughs> Chocopo Bird and Final Fantasy. So it's a bird you can actually use your character to ride on. So that's a interactive thing. And then also the Pokeballs in Pokemon Go, right? So those are little assets. Now, in current state, virtual game assets exist solely in their own game environments. That means if you have a, if you see a game asset in Pokemon Go, it belongs inside Pokemon Go. Screenshots don't count, right? You're not porting it outside of that game. It still belongs inside that game. So some of the problems that player experience is that, for example, if a player has created their own character in the game Oblivion, for example, she cannot port that character beyond the game itself. So if you want to take that character outside of the game, you can't really do that. Of course you can draw it or you can do a screenshot, but that's still not the same thing as taking the original high quality asset outside of the game. Also, just because you created a game character, the game developer never guaranteed you a permanence of that character because games usually don't last forever and once the game dies, the character dies with the game. Okay, So those are the problems we're facing. So let's go next. Okay, so here's a site that has a funky name, but it calls itself Free My Funk. <laughs> they are calling for a revolution, and they call it a re funk -illusion. okay? So you're uh, virtual junk. E yeah, okay, yes. Um, it, it was a weird <laughs> name. <laughs> it caught my attention, okay? I thought it was a fake site at the beginning. Then I started to read Coinbase and other... <laughs> <laughs> blockchain site to make sure this uh, this site is legitimate, and what it is, it's it's using blockchain to crew, uh, to store virtual game assets as their own tokens. Okay, so let me ah. explain more. So, free my Vunk, they basically assign a virtual object to their own token, and they call their own token. Well, they they don't call virtual objects as virtual objects. They call them virtual junk. So they combine. <laughs> virtual junk together and they turn that into VUNK and their currency is V and K for VUNK, okay? So the virtual in-game objects according to the way they discuss it is that they basically free the game object from the game environment. So now, what do you mean by freeing it? That means you can actually trade the, the, the game objects with each other using those game tokens. So I didn't post that link on here, and I probably should sure, because I had to update some links here, that there was a trade of an in-game object or $100,000 <laughs> between players. That just happened. So in-game virtual objects are starting to become as expensive as museum pieces as soon as people start to use blockchain to save them. 
Yeah, so that's that's kind of crazy, but that's what we're going. <laughs> and, and and here, you know, I, I I pulled up in in Second Life just because a lot of educators have used Second Life one time or another, and the, and this is my avatar in Second Life. I would love to be able to transport this character, you know, and to some to some other world or do something or do something else. Right. And a friend uh, explained to me a long time ago the idea that if you want to maintain your identity, you plank across you plank across social media. Meaning, you use the same avatar picture. Let's say, mm -hmm. for example, your second life character, and use that same picture and put it on every single social media that you can find and put that picture there. Right? That's called planking. Now, it would be awesome if you can actually take this character outside of Second Life, and instead of planking, you can actually just call that character. Oh, yeah. forward. That would be pretty awesome, really. Um, so yeah, that's a great example of a character we want to save, right? Because you invest all this time, you have this relationship with this character, and let's say Second Life goes down, and I'm not bad mouthing Second Life. Let's just say it's no, a scenario. no, it could it could be it could be anything, <laughs> but I mean, there's lots of objects in here, and I mean, the thing about it is because Second Life allows you to do things. I have lots of like textures. For, for landscapes, for walls, and stuff like that, that I, that, I would, that I would hate to lose. Absolutely. Yeah, if you spend all that time making them, of course you want to keep them, you know. So, yeah, that's, that's – hopefully this will be something that you can, we can try out and see how well it works, oh, yeah. but we would have to turn things into tokens first. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and then there's the Gravitar. <laughs> so, Chris, so, you know, Gravitar is made by Yahoo, so – yeah. I don't know how long Gravatar, you know. Let's I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about what's going to happen with Gravatar also. Oh, I'm sad. Okay, so let, let's move on. <laughs> okay, here's another one, okay, as an example of using virtual objects. So this one, this is actually a game called Deck Bound Quest. So there's actually cards, and it's hard to see right now, and the bottom of the screen on the left-hand side, you see those four cards, and those four cards are powers, so when you're playing as a character, you can use the card to attack an enemy, okay? But these cards are not just used in the game, but you can actually trade the cards between games. So um, let's go next and I'll explain how that works. So Deckbound is actually a company, okay? It's a developer, uh, you can think of the game studio. And their goal is to make a series of games. They're their own games that are all safe on their own internal blockchain. And all of them are actually card games. So I guess that company is really set on card games. Okay, so every game has to do a card somehow. Whether it's a platform or MLOPG, their goal is everything's cards. Because the idea is that cards, the player can jump from one game to the other and then go, I want to trade my card game from one game, which is they have two games now, deck card or deck bound quest and deck bound heroes. So According to their site, you can trade cards from quests to heroes, even though they're two completely separate games. That's because they save all the data on their deck-bound blockchain. Okay, and, and according oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say I can I can understand why they might want to make it cards because right because right now with how popular you know collectible cards are, it's some it's something that someone could easily see as transportable. Right. You know, from one game or to, from one universe to another, unless unless you're and and it and it's something physical, okay? Right. And and you've talked about it before. If something's physical, it's easier for people to visualize and get that concept when it when it goes virtual. While while something like like a texture for an avatar clothing might be more difficult for uh, for people to think about. So they might they might have been using a very interesting product development strategy that that since cards are very tangible and popular to go with that first exactly exactly okay and you know in game development basically in the design world beyond game development it's called skeuomorphism right so skeuomorph is to turn is to use refer to reference real world objects in the design of virtual objects technically all game most games, I don't want to say all games, but most games basically are skeuomorphic, right? So when you say cards, yeah, people can relate to cards better. We already have a culture where people trade mm -hmm. cards. Yeah. I mean, even before Pokemon Go, you have physical card players, right? Trading mm -hmm. real Pokemon cards. 
Um, so certainly, yeah, that, that certainly speaks to why probably they decide to go with cards. I think it's kind of early in the game, though, and everything is about cards, so that's, I, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I'm looking at their site right now, and you might be talking about this already, but he, yeah. here we go again with the Genesis block. What? Yeah, this is according, and the, the technology, they actually explain it down to a T. I didn't put it all here, but if you guys are interested, it's on the website. If you go into the, the card... Well, actually, if you just keep on investigating, <laughs> there's a link on there. But here's, according to the developer, just what he said. He says all the cards and their attributes are permanent. So you can't go manipulate the cards. If the card is level 3, you can't mess with it, okay? Their abilities are mapped specifically to each game according to their Genesis block. So all that, the Genesis block is where they save all the maps, powers, and, you know, permanent information inside the Genesis block. And everything that derives out of that Genesis block, which is additional cards, follow the rules and the maps that are recorded in the Genesis block. Okay, so that's how they're doing it. Um, now, one thing I did know, this is my own question, okay, because I'm still investigating, which is whether or not the player can actually trade those deck-bound cards beyond the platform itself. That means if I want to trade a deck-bound card with a Pokemon Go player, I don't think that's possible right now. But certainly, if we're thinking more cross-platform, that's naturally where things have to go. Right? Well, it could, it could work. I mean, they would just have to figure out the equivalencies. Right. I mean, that, that's basically what it is, is that they would have to create a, a an equivalency database that says, that weights each of the cards so that you're trading likes for likes, right. as opposed to, you know, I'll give you one Pichacucha for however many Magic the Gathering cards. Um, right. So, right. you know, so, so I think that that's, that's the piece that's there, is that really it's just a matter of, you know, establishing... What the worth of the cards are, and of course that can that can just be handled via economy. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pieces. gonna like yeah, right. So trading trading between economies. I mean, I know that's possible because I'm playing with those concepts now. It's just that mm -hmm. in terms of deck bound, I I don't know if they're gonna offer that. Well, the other thing that would be cool is if you can actually port in your cards from one game to a, to another. So you know, if you wanted to play your Hearthstone characters yeah. into another game and allow you to... But again, it would have to come up with equivalencies to see what counteracts what and different things like that. It'd be interesting. You really have to really expand your strategic knowledge of where everything goes. I mean, imagine D&D &D, D &D cards or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, it's a physical with a virtual. That is where the sweet spot is, I think. Between and, the and look, I, I'm just on there and I'm just going to pull this up. This is... They, they have something called Nomad Cards, and this right. is, you know, how, how we talk free and freemium and, 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 you know, play to purchase. This is interesting. The Nomad Cards, you can play. There are no costs to you. <laughs> right. But they have to retain after a play session. So it's like you get to try on the card, like you're trying on some clothes or something like that. So that you can... That's I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm just enjoying this... This potential. Very, what? Very it's like a free to play, right? It's like free to play, but using cards to say you can play this, but there's no permanence to that card, so therefore. Well, you yeah. So you it. have to take it, you know. But yeah, but I mean, here's the thing. A lot of the free to play, it's still your character. You can only go up to a certain level, or mm -hmm. you can have other access. Here, it's like here, feel the cards, play with the cards, pet the cards. But now we're going to take them back. So you decide if you want to purchase. I, exactly. I think that's very interesting for a virtual good. <laughs> interesting development. See, this is why it's fun to talk about this because it's already happening. It's just not really that commercial or, or widespread yet. But I, I'm interested to see what Deckbound's going to do. Um, yeah, let's go next. All right. Oh, there you go. Okay, third section. Um, game worlds on blockchain. So let, let, let me... Oh. By the way, this is this is Bastion. I'm talking to the nerds out there. Uh, this is <laughs> this game is awesome on mobile and awesome on PC. Okay, so if you haven't played Bastion, B-A-S-T-I-O-N, I highly recommend it. It's probably one of the most visually pleasing games in recent memory, and it's been around for what th maybe three years. But this will be an example of a game world inside Bastion. Okay, so let me explain to you what what I mean by putting them on blockchain. 
this is something that hasn't happened yet, but I'm just going to share you some of my vision um, on what's going to happen. So this is a scenario. Let's say PlayStation asks all Vita game studios, so game students that make games for Vita, to record their games on their own studio blockchain and join the studio's blockchain to the Vita blockchain. Each game studio's blockchain genesis block includes rules and maps that govern the world and environment of their own studio game. Now, the Vita players can travel between the fantastic game worlds of Bastion, for example, that I just showed you, and Danganronpa uh, 3 via Vita blockchain. So Danganronpa, it's actually missing an N, oops. But <laughs> Danganronpa is another game where it's actually pretty violent, but it's very, very popular in Japan. And it's a game where the player died by their own sin. So whatever character, I shouldn't say player, but the character died by the sin that they committed. So if this character happened to be a baseball player, they might die a horrible death where they get mauled by like 10,000 baseball uh, hit, hitting them at the same time. It's kind of a violent fighting game. But the point is that to jump from a bastion world into Danganronpa, I think it's possible if you store those game world uh, information inside a blockchain. So that sounds like an interesting possibility. So let's go next. Okay. So another scenario is crossing character between worlds. So let's just go ahead and go forward. Okay, so here's another scenario. It hasn't happened yet, okay? But let's say Nintendo and Niantic. we got to talk about Pokemon Go because obviously <laughs> it's pretty big right now. So Nintendo and Niantic ask all Nintendo game studios, so studios who make games for Nintendo, who are interested in forming a game alliance with Pokemon Go to record their studio games on the Pokemon Go blockchain, so on the Pokemon Bowl blockchain, not the Nintendo blockchain. The genesis blocks of the studio's game contain rules that govern character design and behaviors. So how the character moves their arm, how high they jump, velocity, you know, um, how, how fast they run, and so forth is contained in the genesis block. So via the Pokemon Go blockchain, the players of, for example, Final Fantasy series can move their game characters across the augmented reality world of Pokemon Go in which the game characters are behaving according to their original design. So from a game like Final Fantasy, which is actually a PC and PlayStation game, a console game, and you're able to move that character into Pokemon Go or vice versa, I think that is possible. Also, if you put that information inside blockchain, that's a possibility. That would be, re that would, that would be really nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yes. because, here's the thing. We, we, all make, we all make characters, you know, and, and we invest time. And, you know, sometimes we like to do other characters, but it would be very interesting to move, be able to move them from, from world to world. And... Okay, say it's something even, yeah, and I'm just going to use an example that, that a lot of educators know. So think about a character in Second Life. Okay, you have all the abilities that your avatar has in Second Life, but then the same character, say, jumping into an MMO like, like um, World of Warcraft, then, then, it would ha then it could take on the World of Warcraft um, hmm. characteristics. You know, the, mm -hmm. the fighting, the, <laughs> the speed, and everything else. Right. Right, right, right. I, I, yeah, that's definitely... I'm trying to think of the game right now, but it's not coming to me. It was a Nintendo fighting game, unless Kay can remember the name of it right now, where uh, characters... And this, this idea, honestly, I was influenced by that game, where um, different characters from different Nintendo games come together and they go into a battle. But the characters still retain their original... Uh, character behaviors from the game itself. <laughs> yeah. I'm laughing because, yeah, Blizzard's doing that like with Heroes of the Storm. Okay. I see, I see. And yeah. they, also put a, they also put a new char a character into, um, it just came into Overwatch, like I think about a week and a half ago. And, I mean, e even that, I think you're, you're playing like, you're playing the hero class, but I still think, you know, people would like to be able to go from like one place to another, even even on Blizzard, and be able to bring their characters from one place yeah. to another. That's yeah, that's definitely a potential. And still, when we say people using it, that would be giving the people the power rather than, for example, Blizzard saying, "Let me insert this character here." Yeah. Whereas you know, in that blockchain vision, we can take our own little characters and run around yeah. with them. That mm -hmm. that'd be pretty cool. That'd be pretty cool. 
Um, so let's go next. Okay, another scenario, sharing games across platforms. This I'm excited about. So let's mm -hmm. go next. So this is, I was influenced by the report about the VAR port. So let me explain what that is really quick. So you're going to use a combination of blockchain with VAR port. So VAR port is actually a virtual augmented reality port for hosting okay. VR and AR games. So why do you need something like this? Because VR and AR games right now, some of them, for example, on Oculus Rift, it's, 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 you know, it's, you can play on the Oculus Rift, but you cannot play that game elsewhere, right? Or if you can play something on HoloLens, you can't really play on Oculus Rift. Some of it's branding, others is because of limitation of the devices. So Varport is already in existence, okay, a marketplace. It hasn't mm -hmm. gone to the place where it wanted to go, but currently it sells itself as a port or a marketplace, basically, where developers can upload their game onto Varport and turn it into an app. So anyone can play on any device or anything that they want. Okay, that's Varport. Mm -hmm. My thinking is that you can actually, and maybe Varport's listening, maybe later, that you can combine <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> blockchain with Varport, okay? And so that game studios can convert or turn their VR AR game as Varport app safe on the studio blockchain. So they're converting it into app, but they also save that information on their own blockchain. So what happens is that the player can now share and play those games um, on Varport along with other games such as PC games, mobile, Unity, Unreal, Oculus Rift, HoloLens, Nintendo NX, which is a console that hasn't come out yet, but I just decided to put it in there because I'm waiting <laughs> for it to come. Okay. okay. That's fine. We do that a lot. <laughs> so the NX is about to come out. There's a lot of rumors as portable console. I'm not sure, but I'm excited for it to come out. But imagine if a game that's made for that, you know, everything, not just VR, AR, but all those games, because of the blockchain sharing the, the commonality of them and then turning them into apps that you can access, we can mm -hmm. play all of those games no matter what device we use. That's cool. Okay. So let's go, and there's one more scenario I want to share. Okay. All right. Thank you for doing these scenarios. We, I mean, seriously, uh, June was really a declarative knowledge so that we learned what things were, and now July really has been all the different scenarios. Right. And I think scenarios are, are powerful, but I also like to give very specific scenarios because sometimes when you give, like, you know, scenarios out, out in the left field, people can't really relate to it. So I wanted to discuss it really in terms of real game development, <laughs> real game design, before we go off the rails, you know? And also show you some examples of people trying it out already. Um, but th this last one, I kind of talked about this during our uh, game um, blockchain and humanities discussions last mm -hmm. week. But this is, again, about games and IOTs and blockchain. In case if you don't know what IOTs are, Internet of Things. So you see in the background, there's a guy wearing a pair of sneakers. And the sneakers mm -hmm. happen to be an IoT, and they map it to the software so you can actually see the <laughs> mobility of the sneakers. <laughs> so that counts as an IoT, okay? You have access to the internet. That's, that's what that is. Okay. So let's go next. All right, so here's a vision, and I decided to throw in Free My Bunk because we just I just gave you guys that. So I said, <laughs> a player uses Free My Bunk to collect and record virtual in-game objects as tokens on a blockchain and record physical Internet of Thing toys on that blockchain. So the player can now access both the virtual in-game assets, just, just like a virtual Pikachu play card, okay, mm -hmm. and access information of the physical Pikachu stuffed toy or stuffed doll from the same blockchain. So you have the virtual and the physical stored in the same place. They both carry, or each of them carry, different hash value. So this way you can prove the ownership of the player who owns that blockchain, right? So the block, <laughs> so the owner can say, I own the physical and yeah. I own the virtual and I have timestamp and everything on everything I own. And you know what's scary is I think maybe in the future when we buy like a, a stuffed animal that we flip the stuffed animal back and there's a long hash value <laughs> tattooed <laughs> Well, and I mean, that's not yeah. that, you know, like, it might not be that bad of a, I think that we might be closer to that one than, than a, a lot of other things, because I will tell you, and I'm, as you're talking, I was just thinking Webkins. 
Yeah, yeah. And Webkin, Webkin's is popular with the grandparents at, at the college where I work. And the reason it's popular is they get it for the kids, and then they go on with their grandkids at the exact same time, and they play synchronously with their grandkids. Plus, their grandkids have the, that toy. So I think that, you know, scenarios that deal with something like that are not that, are not that far away. Yeah, it, actually, different versions of it already occurred. You know, like webcam is an excellent example. It's just that on a greater scale, I guess, with yeah. the blockchain technology and the individual deciding and making those blockchain um, so that, you know, no one's determining whether or not you own something, but also mm -hmm. you can do it yourself. I think that's a cool future. But, you know, it, 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 like webcam that you were talking about, I also mm -hmm. thought when you were talking about webcam, how it would look like, like we go to a grocery store, everything is stamped. <laughs> I remember seeing a banana, you know, with like the code on there. I'm like, what yeah, is this? Yeah, no, exactly. Everything might get coded in the future, man. I mean, it's this long 64-digit <laughs> or whatever digit the lady come up with a longer security with a long code, you know, on every so single this object. This is my banana and no one else's. Oh, my God. <laughs> I blockchained it. <laughs> and, and imagine, you know, we have these these smart watches, right? Imagine there's like a little scanner going, that's why it's mine, you know, because the hash, I can't remember, but my phone, my, you know, my watch and my phone or whatever on my body part can identify that thing as mine. Oh, goodness. Goodness. Um, that, okay, so today, this is probably the shortest presentation from me because yeah. I'm very long-winded. <laughs> but I'm going to stop here. So Chris and Kay, do you have anything else that you want to, to add or question? Or? Well, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Chris go ahead and, grab, and, and, and say whatever he feels. No, I think it's a really good way to uh, wrap everything up. I think that looking towards uh, the future and seeing how we can use blockchain and how it might affect us, I think this is a nice uh, ending piece since we've talked about almost every other area of, of all of our lives. So it's nice to get into gaming and looking at uh, how blockchain can affect gaming. There, as, as we've always said, there are definitely some pros uh, and there's some definitely some cons. So it'll be interesting to see... Uh, how this all uh, shakes out. And, oh, and, and I was going to say, I, like, here's, look at the, what I just put up on the screen, right? And I am in Second Life, and I am in a virtual store, and there's the engineer's hat. And it's, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's not even steampunk, it looks diesel punk. So it's a diesel <laughs> punk hat, which is, you know, which is a really, really niche group, you know, a niche group of people like these kind of things. But the thing of it is, you know, what if I just love this so much, this virtual object, and wanted to take it from Second Life into some game that I played? I mean, I would not spend a lot of real currency to do it, but is there a chance that I would spend, you know, 99 cents to do it? Absolutely, you know, a dollar ninety nine. But wow. you know that that's what that's what capitalism is about: figuring out what what the sweet spot is. And mm -hmm. and I mean that the blockchain does give us a possibility if the te technology can work it in that way. And you, you've shown us some good examples where it might be able to work that way. But we could take our things from one place from one virtual world or game to another one. And I think that and I think that would be very attractive to a lot of people. Right. Right. And I'm glad we get a chance to kind of talk about blockchain and death because a lot of people just associate blockchain with Bitcoin and they just stop mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. imagination there. Like, that's yeah. it. Security. That's it. You know, and there's so many different places that can go. And I wanted to also remind everyone, uh, obviously with presentations, I can't cover every article that I put on the page. <laughs> but if you wanted to see, like, crypto world of games, there are more articles, and I might update a few more today. <laughs> okay, okay, great. Other directions, okay? But that is it for me. Okay. Thank you very much, and this will be ending our, our big blockchain extravaganza <laughs> that went over two months and started with the blockchain revolution, but we definitely put our spin and our interest as educators, as, as gamers and game designers, we definitely put our spin on to it, which, which was good. So thank you very much, and thank you, Sherry, so much for doing this with us. And goodbye, everybody, and we'll you know, see you online. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.